Welcome to the Listening Time Podcast. Hey everybody, this is Connor and you're listening to episode 81 of the Listening Time Podcast. I want to thank everyone who's joined my membership. I really appreciate your support. Uh, Honestly, I wouldn't be able to record these episodes and I wouldn't be able to do this podcast if I didn't have your support. So thank you very much for that. Uh, If you're not a member and you enjoy this podcast and you find it useful and you want to help me out and support me a little bit, then please consider becoming a Listening Time member, super member, family member, or Listening Time VIP, which is the newest tier. Uh, And you'll get my specialized training, you'll get extra episodes, uh, you'll get all of that stuff. Specifically, if you want my advanced podcast episodes, then be sure to become a Listening Time family member or VIP, and you'll receive two new advanced episodes every month. And in those episodes, I speak fast, I speak at normal speed, so you have the chance to practice with real English. But, of course, I provide the transcript for you to help you understand what I'm saying. Uh, So if you'd like that, please become a family member or VIP. And specifically, if you become a Listening Time VIP, you'll be able to ask me questions about English or about language learning every week. And I'll answer these questions in a video Q&A session, a questions and answers session. So if that's interesting for you, then make sure to become a Listening Time VIP. All right. Well, in today's episode, we're going to talk about some precursors to things that we use today. What is a precursor? A precursor is something that comes before something else something that precedes something else. Uh, So we're going to talk about some of the things that we use today and the things that we used to use before these things became popular. This will be a fun one because we'll be able to remember some of the things we used to use in the past that aren't uh, used nowadays. They're irrelevant now. So I think this will be a fun episode. Remember that you have the transcript for this episode in the episode description below the episode. Uh, So click on that if you need it. Of course, in the episode description, you'll also find the link to join my membership. So make sure to go down and click on that. And if you like this podcast, please give it a five-star rating and leave a review And please share it with anyone else who might find it useful, any friends or family members who are learning English. All right, let's get started. Are your ears ready? You know what time it is. It's listening time. Okay, we're going to talk about some precursors to things that we use today. So remember that a precursor is something that comes before something else. It's something that precedes something else. So I want to talk about the precursor to Facebook. So a lot of people have Facebook. This is one of the most popular social media apps. This is probably the most popular social media app of all time, right? This is the one that really became very, very big some years ago. And of course, it's still a very, very important company, an important app, but it didn't always exist. So I remember that before Facebook in the US, a lot of people used a website called MySpace. If you aren't familiar with this website, that's normal. I don't think this website was very big in a lot of other countries. Um, I've talked to some students that have told me that they've heard of this before, but I think it was most popular in the U.S. This was really popular among teenagers and maybe young adults, but not older people. Uh, I think that mostly younger people and teenagers uh, used this website. 
and it was the precursor to Facebook. So it worked a little bit different and it looked a little bit different than Facebook. Um, on MySpace, you had a profile page that was more uh, personal and you could personalize it to uh, match you as a person. So people would use different colors, they would use different fonts. Uh, in English, the word font refers to the style of the letters on a computer screen. So you could use different fonts, you could uh, use different backgrounds, um, you would put the music that you liked uh, that would play when someone clicked on your profile. And it looked like uh, more of a profile page that showed something about you. You would write about yourself and this is something that everyone would see if they clicked on your profile. And one of the biggest features uh, of MySpace that people would see if they clicked on your profile is they would see your top friends. And usually this would be a top eight. So the top eight friends section of your profile uh, is where you would rank the top eight other MySpace profiles uh, from your friends or family members, and you would put them in order. So your number one, your number two, etc. And usually people would have a top eight, but they could also expand this and make like a top 16 or something, or maybe just a top four. But the conventional uh, standard was top eight. Eight. And for me, this was the most interesting part of MySpace because this is where people would uh, have to choose who their best friends were. Uh, this was interesting because you don't always think about this. You don't always rank your friends in your own mind and think who is above who, who's below who. But MySpace kind of made you do that. And this would obviously cause a lot of drama. So if you saw that you were number five on one of your friend's top eight list, uh, but another friend was number four or number three, you would assume that that other friend uh, is a more important person or is a better friend than you are uh, to the person who has that MySpace page. So this could obviously cause drama between friends because you had to choose who uh, was above who. And so people uh, arranged this top eight very carefully. <laughs> they did this um, with a lot of caution. Uh, in English, when we say that you do something with caution, this means that you do it carefully, you do something that involves risk, and so you're careful when you do it. So when people arranged their top eight, they had to do this with caution because they knew that there could be consequences uh, depending on how they arranged this. So that was a really interesting feature of MySpace. And this isn't something that people have to deal with, with Facebook or other social media apps. So MySpace was pretty unique when it came to that. Um, however, at some point, MySpace completely disappeared. <laughs> so when Facebook was introduced, uh, MySpace became a little bit less popular as the months went by, as the years went by. But after a few years, uh, once Facebook got really big, virtually everyone left MySpace. <laughs> Almost everyone abandoned this and started using Facebook, and MySpace became a thing of the past. This is an expression that we use in English. We can say that something is a thing of the past. This just means that something uh, was big in the past, but now it's not important anymore. So MySpace became a thing of the past 
when Facebook became more prominent, more popular. So uh, that's the first precursor I wanted to talk about. The next precursor is the precursor to Netflix. So I know that a lot of you probably use Netflix or some similar streaming uh, app, some streaming uh, service. So I'm not only talking about Netflix here, but Netflix is the biggest one. It's the one we think of first when we think of this type of service. So that's why I'm using Netflix here. Uh, the precursor to Netflix in the U.S. was a company called Blockbuster. Uh, this was a company that was big for many years. This company was popular and important for many years all throughout my childhood and probably before I was born. Blockbuster was the company that rented out uh, movies. So people would go to the local Blockbuster store because they had many stores in all the different cities. So they would go to the local Blockbuster and they would be able to browse through the store and look at all the different movies that they had. In English, when we say that you browse, we're saying that you look through some place, uh, some collection, you are looking at all the different things somewhere. So people were able to browse the store and see all the different movies that were available. And when they found a movie that looked interesting for them, they would take it to uh, the counter, to the cashier, and they would pay to rent this movie. And so this was the original uh, movie rental service. I don't know if there was a company before this, but this was the one that existed when I was a kid. So obviously this was very different, uh, very different from Netflix. So you had to go to the store and you had to um, grab the physical DVD or VHS maybe uh, that you wanted to, to rent. And then you would go and, and take that home with you and you had to return it later. So you had to go back to Blockbuster um, a few days later and return that movie. So, of course, there would be a fee if you didn't uh, return it on time. We had a late fee. Uh, a fee just refers to money that you need to pay. So you had to return these movies on time or else you would pay a late fee. And it was like a membership because people had a Blockbuster card. And so this would have your information on it. It would have your name, your birthday, things like that. So for example, if you were a kid and you wanted to rent a mature movie that was only for adults, um, you weren't able to do this at Blockbuster because they would see on your card that you're only 13 years old, for example. So you weren't allowed to rent uh, movies that were for people that were 17 or older. So you had these age restrictions uh, because uh, you had your membership and Blockbuster could see your age. Uh, so that was something that existed. And then also people rented games from Blockbuster. They rented video games for Xbox, PlayStation, you know, different consoles. Uh, I remember renting some games as well. And so you could only play them for a certain amount of time and then you would return them. Uh, I'm not a gamer nowadays, so I don't know if this is popular, but I would assume that most people that play video games on these consoles nowadays probably buy their video games. They probably don't rent most of them. But when Blockbuster was around, it was pretty common to rent games. So you would rent it, 
play it uh, for many hours that week and then return it. And uh, hopefully you were tired of it by that point and you didn't want to play more. And so you could return it and just get another one. So that was pretty common as well. And I rented some games, but I mostly rented movies uh, when I went to Blockbuster. So uh, I have good memories of going to Blockbuster when I was a child. I would ride my bike there uh, on Fridays and rent a movie or a couple movies and watch them over the weekend. And I would ride my bike back there next week and then return those movies and rent other movies. Uh, this was something that I did a lot when I was a kid and I'll always have those memories of this company. Okay, one more precursor that I want to talk about is the precursor to GPS navigation. So, of course, most of us nowadays when we drive, uh, if we have a phone, if we have a smartphone that has the internet, we can use some type of GPS navigation, some map app uh, that will tell us how to get to our destination. It will give us the directions and guide us directly to that place. Um, this is pretty normal nowadays. A lot of people do this. Uh, but in the past, before GPS navigation, we weren't able to do this. So I remember when I first started driving, when I was uh, about 16 years old, um, this type of GPS navigation was not common on most phones. So at that time, I don't remember if I already had a smartphone or not. It was right around the time when smartphones were becoming really normal for people to have. But I don't think I had one uh, at that exact time. And so I didn't have GPS navigation uh, on my phone. And so what I used was a website called MapQuest. So this was the precursor to GPS navigation for many people in the US. So the way that MapQuest worked was that you would type in the address on their website, uh, the address of your destination, and they would generate a list of directions for you. So it would uh, give you this list. It would say, uh, step one, uh, turn right on Central Avenue, right? Step two, uh, turn left on Third Street, etc. And you would have to follow this list of directions until you eventually reached your destination. So this was a very different experience uh, from using GPS navigation where you can see the map and it tells you uh, exactly what to do. It talks to you. It can reroute you. It can you know, do a lot of different things. Uh, in English, when we say that your GPS reroutes you, this means that it takes you in a different direction from what it had originally said, okay? So it can reroute you, it can uh, gather information in real time, it can tell you about traffic, it can do all kinds of things. But before this technology, we just had to use things like MapQuest and print out this list of instructions and try to follow it. So this was the key, is we had to print out this list uh, because we didn't have phones where we could just pull up the list on our phone. We had to print this list onto a physical sheet of paper and then we would take this with us in the car and while we were driving, we would have to look down at this piece of paper and see uh, what the next uh, step was. And this was hard because sometimes you didn't know if you accidentally passed the street or not, and there was no app to tell you that you accidentally passed the street. 
So you had to be very careful when following these directions. You had to try to uh, pay attention uh, to both the paper that you were holding and every street that you were passing. And of course, pay attention to the cars around you and make sure that you were driving safe. And so it was much harder than nowadays. Uh, it was much easier to get lost. And of course, if you were uh, going to some destination that required you to make many, many different turns, then it was more likely that you would get lost at some point because if you had like 20 different steps to follow, if you just made one mistake, then that would be a problem. So you could see how this was harder than nowadays. But this is what a lot of people used and it worked for most people. Uh, I used MapQuest for the first maybe year, year and a half of my driving experience. And uh, I didn't go to a lot of new places that were hard to get to uh, because of this limitation, because I didn't always want to have to use this website, uh, print out the directions, follow them really carefully. Uh, I think that because of that, I didn't look up a lot of new places to go to. I kind of stuck to uh, a lot of the familiar places that I already knew and I didn't need the directions for. But there were many occasions when I did need to use MapQuest and I uh, had to follow the instructions uh, that they generated for me. And uh, this was definitely uh, something that helped me out, but uh, I'm glad that we have GPS navigation now. And before MapQuest and those websites, the precursor to those uh, were physical maps. So when my parents were young, they didn't have any of these tools. And so they actually had to use physical maps when navigating uh, new places. And they had to be able to read those maps and follow them. And this is a skill that many people nowadays do not have. Uh, a lot of younger people, especially would not be able to read a physical map and follow it and not get lost. So the precursor to MapQuest and these other websites was even harder uh, because it didn't give you a list of directions, uh, a list of steps to follow. So uh, it's gotten easier and easier uh, with uh, the advancement of technology, of course. And so these were three of the different precursors uh, that preceded uh, things that we use nowadays. But I'm sure that some of these things that we use nowadays are just precursors to the future thing that we'll use. So it will be interesting to see what technology comes out in the future that will cause these present day tools to become obsolete. In English, when something is obsolete, this means that it isn't uh, useful or relevant anymore. It's a thing of the past. All right. Well, why don't we stop there for today? I hope this episode was interesting for you, and I hope it was good practice for your listening. Remember that you can become a Listening Time family member or VIP if you want my advanced podcast episodes, uh, if you want to practice with real English and reach an advanced level, and if you want to ask me your questions every week regarding English or language learning, then become a Listening Time VIP and you'll be able to do that. You'll be able to ask me your questions and I'll answer them every week in a video Q&A session. So click on the link in the episode description if you're interested in that. That's patreon.com slash listening time. And of course, you have the transcript for this episode in the episode description as well. So click on that if you need it. And please give this podcast a five-star rating if you like it and share it with anyone else who might find it useful. 
All right. Thank you for listening to this episode. And I'll talk to you on the next episode of Listening Time.